Okay. So let's take a look in general. What is this big O and how do we read it? So I need to give you a couple terms and some ways to, to, so you can see it and understand what's going on. Okay, so let me give you some examples of big O. You might say a certain algorithm has a big O notation of O1. You might say it has a value of N. You may say it has a value of N times 2 or maybe N squared or something like that. Okay, so there's different examples of a big O notation. Okay. So this is what it's going to look like. You're going to see a big O, you're going to see parentheses, you're going to see the, the, the letter N, and then you're going to see some other stuff. Okay. So the O stands for order, and that's just talking about the rate of growth of a function and how that, that function is going to grow or how that method or subroutine or whatever you want to call it. So how that algorithm, how big is it? How big is the O? Okay. But O stands for order. You don't have to put any numbers in there. You just have to understand what's going into the parentheses, okay? <coughs> it's kind of like F of N, you know? Okay, anyway. Um, so O stands for the order. So the N stands for the number of items in your data set. So on the previous list, if you had like four elements in an array, all right, the N stands for four because you have four items you're trying to sort, okay? If you're trying to search through 10 items, the N will represent 10. If you've got some big beefy program that has every item in a grocery store in its database, you're going to be talking about thousands of items, okay? And the N just always represents the number of items that we're dealing with, okay? Okay, so if we want to see, now there's a huge list of big O notation and we have a whole cheat sheet on it. So uh, let me just show you this page because uh, this will be a really handy resource. Um, if you go study computer science in, co in college. So we're talking about complexities, and we're going to see that a lot of the algorithms are related to searching, and a lot of them are related to sorting. So you look at search, we list out the different kinds of algorithms, and then we have the data structure that's being used to deal with the search. Then we look at the time complexity, we look at the space complexity, we have what the average time it takes to do it using big O notation, and we have the worst case scenario using big O notation. In some cases, it doesn't matter whether it's best or worst case, it's always going to be the same. Okay? And this is talking about time, and the far right is about space. So you can look here and you can see what the big O notation is for different kinds of things. You do a linear search using brute force, it has an O notation of ON. Um, and on the worst case in space, it's O1. And so let's talk about the different values now. Because you, you still don't know how to read it, right? But at least we know the O is just talking about the, that's big O. And then what goes in parentheses is the actual measurement. Now, on the next site, I could have put all this stuff into a PowerPoint. Um, I decided that was going to take up a lot of time, so instead I want to go to the website where I got this information from. Okay, So I'm going to go back to that beginner's guide to big O notation by Rob Bell. Rob Bell, thank you very much. You did a great job. Let's take a look at what Rob Bell has to say about big O notation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the different scenarios. O1 describes an algorithm that always executes in the same time regardless of the size of the input data set. A great example is a method that uses an if statement. Okay? We have an if statement. If the string is at the first index position is null, there's nothing in it, we return true. Okay. So it doesn't matter how many items are in the list it's going to run one piece of execution if it is null and another if it's false. That's an O of one because it does a one-time check and it executes one of two options. So when we're talking about if statements and their combinations, we're talking O1. Okay? It doesn't matter. We could have an array of 80,000 items. And if that first one is null, we return true. If it's not, we return false. We're done running that method. Took us one comparison. And O of N is now saying the performance is in direct proportion to the size of your data set. O N. So if we have an array of 10 items, it's going to cost us 10 
as far as the order of progression. Okay? So the, the, the big O of N favors our worst case scenario. So it doesn't matter uh, if it's the worst case or not. It's going to take as long as there are items in the source. So here a great example is uh, we're looking for a particular value in a string. And if it matches it anywhere, we're going to return true. So in order to do that, we've got to look at everything in our array. So we run a for loop through it. Excuse me. I'm losing my voice. We run a for loop through it. And we have to go through everything in the list on the worst, you know, in the, in the case of a worst case scenario. And we, we might have a best case scenario. The best case might be we hit uh, the value right at the beginning. We return true and we're done. Okay. However, the worst case is we're going to have to go through it n number of times. See what I mean? We're measuring the worst case. Okay. Next one is n squared. Okay. This would be an algorithm where it's directly proportioned to the square of the size of the input data set. So this is typically when we have algorithms that have nested for loops. Okay. Um, and so every time you put a for loop inside of another for loop, we are doubling the amount of times we have to go through it. So if we have a data set of 10, we're going to run one for loop here that's going to run 10 times in the worst case scenario. But in each loop, we're also going to loop one more time through each of those 10 items. So now it's 10 times 10. So it's going to take us 100 times in the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario, if we have a duplicate, is that we don't have a duplicate until the very end of our data set. So that's the worst case scenario. We run it through. We have to run a for loop within a for loop. So we go in the first loop, and we have to loop 10 times in the first loop. We go to the second loop, then we have to loop 10 more times, etc. So you see how it's squared the number of times? If we stuck another for loop inside of this for loop, we've now cubed it. So it's that data set to the third power. Okay? And every time you nest something inside, it just keeps adding exponentially the cost to do that algorithm. So that is n squared algorithm. Okay? So whenever you have to nest loops, uh, that's there. And so just know every time um, every time you increase the data set, that becomes much, much larger. So 10 times items is only 100 loops. That's not a big deal. Do it 1,000 times. Now it's 1,000 times 1,000. And so now you have a one with six zeros. Now we're talking a million, right? So that becomes very costly when you have big data sets. Now, let's look at logarithms. And logarithms, um, I, how many of you guys have already done logarithms in some class before? So, yeah, it, in this, you can be thankful that I'm not actually going to explain algorithms. I'm just going to explain how to read and what this log n means. So basically, this is, has, usually has to do with algorithms where we're, 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 we're doing a divide and conquer kind of thing. We split something in half. And we work on one half, we work on another, and we do this kind of thing. What happens is a log n is let's say our data set has 10 items. Okay? And an algorithm of O log n is, and let's just say we're going to just compute it. We figure out to do 10 items, it takes us one second. Okay? So we're going to go off the basis that log 10 takes one second. Well, if we now have a data set that has 100 items, Okay, at that point, log n it's only going to take us two seconds. So every time we take it to the next power, it's only going to take us one more second to do it. That's an efficient one for large data sets, okay? especially when it comes to time. However, to do divide and conquer, usually you have to use a recursive algorithm, and the recursive algorithm is going to take a lot of cost as far as memory is concerned. So there's a trade-off, and there's always trade-offs. Okay, so at this point, what I'd like to do, now that I've talked to you about some just general big O notation, I want to show you some videos now of, um, I want you to see some sorting algorithms visualized and a way to kind of see how they work.